Yes, it is a beautiful, beautiful spring day here. We've had three straight days of just glorious, you know, upper 50s, lower 60s sunshine. Um, I'm figuring it's a little bit warmer down near you. It's probably yeah, not as cool bit. as it is here. A little, yes. Okay. So we are live and I am just making sure that my other screen here, I'm looking at us. That's why I'm chuckling on YouTube, <laughs> on YouTube, oh. Linda Marshall, one of my favorite people in the whole world. <laughs> <laughs> Richard, likewise, likewise. Uh, how are you today here on the one year anniversary? And I'm just getting my ring light set up. I keep forgetting to set my ring light up every time I do these things. Um, as we celebrate the one year anniversary of the pandemic, how are you doing? How, um, how are you feeling emotionally? How are you feeling about the future? Just before we get into your bio, what's your yeah. state of mind at this moment? So for, for me, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a weird doc. Um, through it all, I have maintained my optimism, um, you know, knowing that we've been through so much right. as a nation, as a world, as a global community over the past year. So to me, it's been like the long winter. That's not just the winter on the calendar. It's a winter of a state of being. Yes. And throughout it all, I say, you know, sometimes we have to have a reset. Sometimes we reset ourselves. And then sometimes the universe resets us. And so what is it that we could get out of, learn about ourselves as we've gone through what we've gone through? So for me, it's been a year of great revelation and I'm optimistic, I'm optimistic. I am too. Um, and the beautiful weather the last three days, certainly, and the longer days, the sun now mm -hmm. rises yes, in my right. bedroom window at 5.30, quarter to six, mm -hmm. instead of 6.30, quarter to seven. And it's later at night. So when I'm outside with my son's puppy, yeah, that's, it's still sunshine at 6.15. Oh, it's, you know, and we all just got to take care of each other and, uh, and just push this pandemic out. So um, I am so grateful to know this woman. And, and the, when I talk about Linda's bio, um, what is interesting to me is that um, I don't think I befriended Linda on LinkedIn when she joined American Express back in 07-ish. Um, Linda, we, you were first based in Chicago and then you moved to Philly. No, Philly, when, when then I knew. I, New York, then Chicago. Yeah, okay. the other way, right. And, and I just remember that there was a small period of time where I saw you regularly in the office mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then you like kind of took off. <laughs> I was like, Oh, I lost touch with her. And, and, and while I'll go over Linda's bio in a couple of seconds, um, I think the thing that I find personifies you the most. And the reason why you're here today is you are always different than the other vice presidents on our team. Mm -hmm. You had a presence that was distinct, calming. When I use the word thoughtful, I, I more mean thought filled. Um, you know, some of our colleagues and, you know, Joe, Mark, Tom, you know, they, they were thought filled, but not on the same level as you. And I never realized why until you and I became friends again about four or five years ago. I never knew the part of you that we're talking about today. <laughs> <laughs> Most people didn't. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I think we all felt it. Mm -hmm. I think all of us felt she's more grounded. She's got a foundation that's built on something different than the rest of us. So you grew up, how big was your family? When you first, you know, when you were a small child, four siblings, four of us, four siblings. Yeah. Um, so you, at one point you decided to pick up your life and move to Texas. That's when you joined, I think, AT&T. Was that when you joined AT&T? No, no, I did all kinds of jobs. <laughs> you went to Texas. To yes. Yep. Yes. And you, you started at AT&T in 2003, um, eventually moving yourself up to um, a, uh, director's position 
you were you were doing some some very difficult stuff. Sarbanes Oxley. Um, yeah. I remember working on Sarbanes Oxley compliance at American Express. Oh my goodness, such complex, high risk stuff because you mm-hmm. you have to meet the regulations. Yeah. Um, and then you got wooed to American Express, where mm-hmm. you were a vice president and general manager in the client management team. Mm-hmm. Um, and there were four regional vice presidents at the time. So Linda had three peers at that level. And she reported up to somebody who reported to my boss, Tom Pajero, who was the, the head of the division in merchant services. Um, I left in 2011. And that's when you moved over to Global Corporate Payments, which is a pretty cutthroat business where you were <laughs> vice yeah, president. it was. <laughs> I mean, if if Donna Williams is on this call, Donna and I talk about corporate payments and, and card payment industry. It has been so commoditized and it is such a painful place to be right now because mm-hmm. it's all about price, all about price. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you finally said, no, nah, I'm going to take a break. And you yeah. left American Express in May of 2015. Mm-hmm. And what I didn't know about you was that all along, you have been a practitioner of meditation. Mm-hmm. You, um, how long have you been Chopra Institute certified? Well, Chopra certified for about three, three and a half years. I'm a master instructor of energy healing. And I've been at that level for probably about 15 to 18 years that I am that an energy healer time. along with a meditation along. Yeah. So that, yeah. So. And And we're going to get into all of this, but again, what I'm hoping anybody who's watching right now understands, because Linda is now practicing this as a profession. She works with corporations, with organizations, with individuals, um, and her superpower is this groundedness and this ability to see the world around us from a perspective that brings you calm and helps you see things with clarity. Um, And so all of her practices, you know, kind of meld into that place of if you're if if you're an entrepreneur and you are struggling to understand what to do with your business next. And Linda has helped me on a couple of occasions with my business. um, If you are a professional working in a corporate workplace, if you're an HR executive who has employees who are dealing with that issue, Linda can apply this on all of these different populations because the need is the same, um, you know, to, to, to push out the distractions, to see the world clearly for what it is and where you reside in that world, and then act upon that, to, to have a life that feels fulfilling. So thinking about your bio and yeah. all of the situations that you've been in, you worked in retail management, which is a nutty place oh, to be. Oh gosh, never again. <laughs> <laughs> One and done, as they say. <laughs> yeah, most of us who've worked in retail, that's what we say. Um, so given all of these personal experiences, how have you come about to realizing that you might be, you know, in a situation yourself where, you know, it, whether it was at American Express or AT&T or in retail, that you were living a life and that at some point you realized something was discomforting to you and that you might need to look at a situation and say, I have to let go. Has this been something that you've always had? Is it something that developed with your practice? Well, I'd say, well, first, Richard, thank you for setting me up with that wonderful introduction. I'm going to have to have you do an advertisement for me. I will. <laughs> to describe I will, my superpower. I'll write a testimonial for you any day. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I would say? Probably by nature, I'm a very introspective person. Mm-hmm. And so there have been different inflection points throughout my life where you start listening to the inner voice to say, I can keep going the way that I'm going but something about this doesn't feel right. There's more to this that I want to explore. And I think from the time that I was a kid, it was that sense of wanting, of being empowered, of being in control. Now that that can be an issue, trust me, but a sense of not wanting to get pulled along, but having some say in my destiny. 
And so it started, I, I, I tease people and say, I had my first midlife crisis when I was 25, right? So, you know, you, you graduate from college, you're um, starting to work, you know, you, you, you see this pattern of how life unfolds. So I'm engaged. And then you say, well, the next step is to get married and then you'll have kids. And then one day it just hit me. And I said to my mom, is this what life is? We're born, we work, we have kids, then we die. <laughs> and she said, well, what do you want out of life? I said, I, I don't know yet, but when I think of if this is what my life is going to be, just this routine, that just does not excite me. <laughs> and she said, well, whatever you want, go find it, go find it. And so at that moment, I pondered on that question, ended up quitting my job. I ended up terminating my, my engagement. And I moved to Dallas, Texas, sight unseen, because I wanted to go find out who I was. Sight unseen. And for to me, it was to know who was I when you took me out of the environment where I was raised, when you took me out of the familiar, at the core, who am I? And so that kind of was the question that I would ask at different points when I'd feel that internal rub, who am I? What do I want? Why am I here? And that became kind of the internal, I'd say, guidance for me throughout my life. Do you think that without that conversation with your mother, you would have given yourself the permission to let go? Um, probably I would have over time, mm -hmm. but I think I may have tried to make some of the things work. So I reached a conclusion sooner than later because it was my life and you get to choose. So what do you want? And so I think having her and then my parents who were very supportive, didn't quite understand what I was looking for, but if that's what I wanted, they were accustomed to me being a little different. And so they just would support. <laughs> well, if she says that's what she wants to do, be safe. This is hard letting you go so far away. Couldn't you just go across the bridge? You're going from <laughs> Philadelphia to Texas. What if you get sick? So, you know, the dialogue of parents. Oh, and yes. <laughs> fully, you know, I understand. And I imagine now if I had a child who said to me what I said to them, that would be a little bit scary. What, um, what tools did you have at that early an age when, when so many of us, you know, I place people on a bell curve. And if I'm thinking about you as a woman at 25 years old, mm -hmm. capable of, of look, at looking at what's expected of people in, in those mm -hmm. days. I, I got married in 1988 mm -hmm. um, and I was a little bit early. Um, you know, people were starting to get married a little bit later than I did. I think, I think I was 24 at the time. And I think that was when people started getting married later. And so um, it kind of felt like, well, that's what I'm supposed to do now. Kind of what mm -hmm. you said. And you know, I wonder if things weren't working out back then, if I would have had the courage, because I think on that bell curve, I think some people are as introspective and in touch with themselves, but it's a small slice of us at that early age, because we, mm -hmm. we haven't lived long enough. Mm -hmm. Do you, did you have certain tools or experiences that you think pushed you to the front end of the bell, bell curve that you could do something dramatically more different than probably the rest of us could have at that age? Mm, that's a, a good, good question. I think if I think about it now in hindsight, it was a combination of well, faith, mm -hmm. um, having what I felt a foundation of love and support mm -hmm. that if I did it and it didn't work out, as my dad always say, you come back home. So a foundation of support. So I'm stepping out on a limb, but in some ways I still have a safety net. And then I think courage, you know, courage. Um, the one thing my dad will say, well, well, suppose this happens, suppose that happens. And, and I would always say, well, what's the worst that could happen? Yeah. Because in my mind, well, if that doesn't work, you try something different. And I think there's more information and data today that supports the notion of resilience, Yeah. right? And that how even in children who are resilient, that it has an, an indication of kind of their success in, in life. And so I think maybe I was just wired with that. And so that helped me make the choice at times that I 
feel alone at times that I get nervous or uh, scared, but I just say, okay, this is what you're going to do. So it was always thinking ahead on what I wanted. And if what I wanted, you got to make sacrifices, you got to make trade-offs and you do it. And so I think it was that determination in me. I want to come back at the end to something you just said about what's the worst that can happen. Cause I think that is a nice tool for people to use when they're facing a mental block Mm -hmm. on making Mm -hmm. a decision about letting go of something, because um, at the time that American express was kind of letting me go um, and kind of squeezing me out back in 2010, 2011, um, I had a spiritual director, my parish priest at St. Patrick's Church in Highland Mills, um, Father Travers, and I would go see him about once a month. And when I was having tremendous anxiety and not being able to get to sleep at night, because I knew American Express was coming after me, I hit that stage where they just, I was too expensive and I, you know, they needed that FTE for another role. Um, Father Travers said to me, Rich, why are you losing sleep? What's the worst that could happen? And when he started to get me to think that way, which was a brand new tool, mm-hmm. the anxiety started to dissipate. So, so thinking about the greatest challenges mm-hmm. that you've had in your life, um, and they probably are archetypical to the challenges many of us face. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Wondering if the partner we're with is the right mm-hmm. person. Wondering if, is this it? Is this mm-hmm. everything? Do I you know, is this what I do for the rest of my life? Thinking about that, what do you think is the greatest challenge? And and if there's two or three of them, list all two Mm -hmm. or three that block us from letting go. What, Mm -hmm. what are those blockages that prevent us from saying, no, I can let go of that. Mm -hmm. I'd say fear of failure is a big one. And, you know, if I think of my own life, Mm -hmm. if I think of the clients that I coach, it's mm-hmm. the, the notion that if I give up, if I step away, I am a failure. And so then there's a lot wrapped up in that. It's how I see myself. It's yes. how the world sees me. It's my status. It could be, you know, you know, just a whole bunch. Do I lose the group and the affiliations and the connections and the people? Yeah. So that concept of failing is a, a big one, you know, I, as I see it. A sense of, so that's, that truly is the big one that I see. And then the sense that if I let go, what will fill in the void, right? Because now I've got this space, this thing, like they say, even when you have a toothache, when the toothache is gone, you miss it because it was a presence. So when you think of making big changes in your life, releasing, letting go, now it's this thing. It's this space, it's this void. What do I do with that? So when I think of, you know, what comes to mind for me, those are, and I'm sure later on, I'll think of 10 others, but as I'm coaching, the number one thing I see is fear of failure. Mm -hmm. The judge, judging oneself, judging, being judged, and then judging your circumstances. I I have lived that tenfold. Uh, mm-hmm. thinking, who am I if I don't have this? Yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, and as a result, letting go of it was such a difficult experience. Mm-hmm. So you, you approach life in general from a certain set of methodologies. Um, tell me a little bit about how those methodologies help you when you're in a moment to de- and you have to decide, do I keep going this way or do I let go? How does that work practically? Because, you know, a lot of people will put these memes out on social media and it all sounds so simple. Mm-hmm. Hey, you know, don't let people rent space in your head. <laughs> yeah, but that's easier said than done. You've come to a set of methodologies. Is there a way for you to describe how you apply them when you're in a situation of either comfort or complacency, but you know that you need to let go? Well, you know, as a meditator, so I've been meditating for about 30 plus years now. And one of the aspects of meditation that I think it really helps you get connected to is learning to listen to your internal voice, learning to listen to not the thoughts in your head, but the thoughts in your heart, not the emotional heart, the deeper heart. So the more you build a practice that's around mindfulness, it doesn't just help you when you're sitting there doing it. 
it helps you live your life differently yes. because it expands your intuition, your creativity, your sense of connectedness. And so as you begin to de develop that practice, you then begin to see maybe the world and circumstances a little bit differently. It allows you to not only see visually, but you see that which cannot be seen. So often you're able to pick up on energy and vibes and things that are going on both within yourself and then even with other people. And so often in crises, people would say to me, oh, you're so calm. It wasn't that I didn't feel but I had perspective. And so the more you have perspective and you develop those tools and techniques, it then allows you to show up in the crises with, from a different point of view that the crisis isn't leading you, but right. you can observe and adjust appropriately. And so even when I was working, you know, I sometimes would get teased because, you know, in most of my jobs, they were sales jobs. So they were high pressure, you oh, know, yes. intense. You got deadlines. You don't want to lose the deal. I would have my little spray that I would spray in my office and I would inhale. So something as simple as breathing and slowing down one's breathing when you're in the middle of a crisis or a tough situation gives you the moment to create the space in between your thoughts so that you get to choose your response as opposed to your response choosing you yeah. or you know the situation choosing you and so little techniques like that for me being a mindful has really helped me over the years that sometimes i was in situations where truly i could not control it it was what it was but I got to control my response to it. And if I can control my response, that then gives me the power to show up in however I want and then to make choices that really serve my greater good. And so, you know, those, that's a big one for me is definitely about mindfulness and then sur surrounding myself with positives, right? You know, so I'm very selective around who I let into my inner circle yeah. uh, because that's important. You want things that uplift you. What do you take in? You can't take in the daily doses of all the news and negativity and think that you're going to show up differently. It permeates your energy field. So what information do I need to have? What do I need to know to, to navigate life and be participate? but still not let it take me to a place where energetically, I just don't want to, to be there. So some of the I, things that I've done. I had that experience when my mother passed away, it was either 2008 or 2009. So she, she you know, succeeded in passing away from my father mm -hmm. who died in 2001. Um, and I'll never forget, I'm in the car with my now ex-wife and the kids, we were all driving down to Long Island where she was going to be at the wake. And one of my sisters-in-law, I'm, I'm one of seven boys. Uh, one of my sisters-in-law called me and I had her on the speaker phone in the car. And, you know, she's saying to me, how is it you're not having all of this emotional madness that my husband is having, that his brothers are having? Cause she, they were all coming up from North Carolina together. And apparently there was a lot of anxiety and angst and anger. And, and I said to her, you know, number one, I had started studying Buddhism in 05 or 06. Mm -hmm. I was studying um, some of the great um, fathers and um, mothers of the Catholic church, the saints okay. who had gone off to be monastic and, and then right mm -hmm. from this place of clarity. And the best I could tell her was, look, it isn't going to just happen overnight now. Um, the reason why I am the way I am is because I started to see what you just said. Mm -hmm. I've started to see that there's, there's this greater wisdom that envelops us. And, and once you reside in that space, you just, you, you see the death of your mother, not as a loss of that physical person in my life, but that this is the stage in my life where older people in my family are going to pass. And that's part of life. Part of life is death. And I, you know, I said to her, that's the best I can explain it. I don't know that I'm helpful to you. I said, but it's a, it's a lifelong practice to, mm -hmm. to find yourself in that space where you're not letting everything cause a reaction. Mm -hmm. Do you find in your practice as a professional helping others? So your clients, mm 
mm-hmm. or, or even if it was a friend or a relative who's come to you because they know the power of what you do, mm-hmm. can you, without betraying any confidences, tell us about an ex- experience where you've kind of led a person through that process of, I'm in a situation, I'm going to observe it with some level of intelligence, wisdom, objectivity, mm-hmm. and, and that you were able to guide them to letting it go? Hmm. Well, you know, in the work that I do, it, it, it layers because I'm in some situations a pure coach. And then with some people, I'm more of a coach slash spiritual, we're going to, you know, unwakening kind of relationship. So I think of even in my pure coaching um, situations where I have a, a client and sometimes, you know, what you're helping them let go of is a belief, right? And a belief in um, who they think they are that's not necessarily serving them. And so the stories that they've told themselves about who they are then get in the way of them really showing up to achieve the things that they want in life. And so through inquiry around who are you, why do you believe that? Is that true? most of what we think goes unexamined. So in the process of questioning, who are you? And then helping a person kind of go through the process of who are you? And so do a lot of internal work because in order for you to make change in your life, it's very easy for me to talk about goals and objectives. Those are the physical manifestation of something but the mind and the heart have to be aligned in this for that to manifest in a way that you want. So that a lot of what I do is helping a person identify kind of what are their beliefs? So if we could recraft and rewrite the story of who you are, the why, and what it is you want and play with that, you see people's lights start to go off. So once the lights start to go off, now we can move into, okay, now that you know this is what you want, a couple of things. Maybe you might need to remove yourself from where you are. Another might be you might need to reframe it because sometimes we tell ourselves a story so long, but if I looked at it from another lens, from another perspective, I may see it's not quite what I thought. And if I reframed it, then how do I continue to succeed or excel? Give give me an example of that because last week I interviewed um, Jennifer Donchez. She is a very Mm -hmm. successful woman business owner out of Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. And she she said the very same thing you just Mm -hmm. did is that sometimes we frame things in a certain way and we need to reframe it because it's that simple adjustment that might trigger the behavior that you were looking for because mm-hmm. you're not stuck thinking a certain way. How do you do that? Because it's a phrase I hear a lot, but I'm not sure I understand how to define it. Okay. So an example, I have one of my coaches who's working in an organization. It's um, a startups kind of situation. So maybe not as organized, maybe not as structured, feeling really frustrated around the organization and feeling that they're not moving as quickly as they could. So part of it was to say, okay, this is where you're at. Based on the chaos, how can you take the positive, the negative and convert it into a positive? So what could you get out of this chaos that you wouldn't get if you were in a more traditional work environment? So this person said, well, here I get to be creative. Here I get to experiment. Here I get to do these things. Um, that I wouldn't be necessarily be able to do if I was in this more structured environment. Here, really, I can have a voice at the table that in a larger organization at my level, I may not be able to influence policies in the same way and contribute ideas. So I said, okay, when you go to the next meeting, what might you do differently? I'm going to show up with this voice, with this lens, Versus my other viewers, you know, they just don't know what they're doing. So went to that meeting, we coached again and was amazed when his boss said, oh my God, you were awesome. 
everybody was in the chat talking about what you were, your ideas and your thoughts. Where's this guy been? <laughs> right. And so while he was criticizing them for not being a certain way in his mind, not criticizing, right. when we reframed what that same situation could give him in terms of opportunities, now he's learning. They're talking about promotion and all of these things. Nothing changed except how he viewed it. And now he took that chaos and created an opportunity. Does that help with it? It, it does. It, I, what I'm curious about, about the, the story you just told is, did he have a misperception about the situation because they received him so warmly and they, they ran with it. And, and yet that seems to have been the opposite of what he was expecting. Well, it's like we, how he, he's not unique, right? Right. We all have, we have this, framework or we call the judge from my mental fitness training that has a, a pre-defined way on how we think the world is supposed to show up. Right. So we go into many situations with expectations. Yes. And that's not bad, but sometimes we can be rigid because the world doesn't present it to us in that way. So how do I adjust to say, is there something in here that could be um, useful, beneficial? Let me stop judging it and show up and look at it from how can I grow from this? How can I learn from this? How can I contribute? So I think his perspective was his perspective, but I think for many of us, it's that way. It just may not be as profound at its work, but we're all going in with predefined expectations of what we think the world is and what things should be. And it's, it's, it's about letting go of that. It's when I, you know, and I could be totally wrong with placing myself in this individual situation. Mm -hmm, but what I'm thinking in that person's moment before they spoke to you was intuitively, mm -hmm. they had this belief that you said, mm -hmm. and this narrative going on in their head saying, these people don't respect my creativity. These people mm -hmm. have their way of doing things and I don't necessarily like it. And I'm not necessarily happy with it. And mm -hmm. he had a lot of this, that, this is what I'm hearing is that he had mm -hmm. this jumble in his head that was partly maybe a reflection on, I'm a creative person. How do I just stand in the brilliance of my creativity and let the chips fall where they may. Mm -hmm. And when he finally had the courage to just stop criticizing himself or, or, or maybe it's a combination of things, not believing in the power of himself or herself, um, not believing that the environment would accept that part of him mm -hmm. or her. Once that individual dropped the intuition of, well, this is the, you know, this negative is, it, it does exist, it's real. Once that person let that go, the whole world opened up. Mm. Is that right? Is that kind of how it happened? Well, you know, some, to some extent, yes. And what I would say is it, is it, you know, I don't think that their experience is unique in that Not at all. jumble, right? That we all have that. So that's why I keep coming back to, we all have it. And it's just sometimes if we could walk around it almost as if we were a drone and look at it from another perspective to say, gosh, how can I innovate? How, what can I explore and ask ourselves those questions? And we can see, well, maybe I can use this to my advantage. And that's so much of what I think it is in terms of how do I make changes? How do I reframe? Because reframing is about seeing it like, a, you know, photography is one of my hobbies. So how do I see it differently? And that's, yeah, part of what it is. I, I always tell people that if I hadn't become a journalist and then gotten into communications and now I've found my way into coaching, I probably would have been a psychologist. And it's because I love trying to understand how people tick. I don't know why, but that I love observing people and trying to figure that out. Do you believe that to some degree we're hardwired to be a certain way because of things that happened when we were a child and maybe in our first job and maybe we had some kind of trauma at 32 and that and that we get locked into things that 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 are really big obstacles to letting go or do you see human minds and human nature as more pliable well, do you think I have a PhD in psychology or psychiatry or something, no. Richard? 
I'm asking you as someone who works with people. <laughs> okay. So what is interesting that my original career was I was going to be a school teacher. And uh-huh. then I read Sigmund Freud when I was in high school. Uh-huh. After I read Sigmund Freud and just could read everything about Sigmund Freud, I became very interested in the mind consciousness and awareness and decided that I would be a psych major. Then started working on my undergraduate with then my master's and then said, you know what? I think I read, I don't want a PhD, so I'd rather go make money. So I'm going to go to business. And so ended up going to business. And then I laugh as I come back to this space of what I would call human performance, human um, awareness, um, the state of the human psyche. And so to answer your question, I think it's a little bit, I think that we probably come with some type of predisposition. That when you look at a baby, just some children are a little bit more anxious, some are a little bit more joyous. So I think we may have some predisposition, but then I do think environment plays a role in, you know, how a child might show up and how they may, the lens from which they start to see the world. Because it's like your family and your environment is the soil. Your seed grows in that soil. You may absorb the nutrients. You may absorb some of the chaos. Um, some to a greater extent than others, but I do believe that there's are tips and techniques that can help you once you become aware that that you have options, that tips and techniques that can help you begin to adapt in a different way if you find that the behaviors that you are exhibiting are not serving your highest healing, highest good, and your greatest success. So there are, you know, I never want to minimize that there are people who have endured deep and severe trauma and that the appropriate care should be given and support for those. But for many people who haven't had that thing, they still have stuff. And so a lot of the work that I do around mental fitness based on the work of Shirzad Shamin around positive intelligence is about helping you to rewire the brain. And it's about, we have this primal um, primitive brain that is the, f- the fear response, right? Fight or flight. And how do I increase the functioning of my executive brain, which then helps me make more um, informed and better choices. So I think it's a little bit of both, but I do believe that with focus, it's something that we can begin to um, alter once you realize kind of what's getting in the way. Because it, it, as young people, so often we develop certain behaviors because they serve us. And it's like, if I have a hammer, then I, as a carpenter, you know what, I treat everything Looking with a hammer, nail. right? Looking for that <laughs> nail. But then over time, I may need a different set of skills. But if I'm stuck in seeing everything from the framework of the, huh, I limit myself in terms of my options and my ability to respond to life. Yeah. So I believe that you have the ability to reset. I so believe that because I was telling Linda before we started that I was struggling with something with a a client of mine. And I did a brainstorming last night with a gentleman who I just treasure, Aaron Schlein. Um, And Aaron and I were just brainstorming some ideas. And he comes at things from a different perspective that my brain just is not neurologically set up for. And once he started introducing some of his creativity, all of a sudden I saw pathways that I hadn't seen until he said these things. And I'm Mm -hmm. like, Oh my goodness, how, how, how did I not see that? How did you introduce that to me? So I totally believe what you're saying. And, and I personally have felt the power of mindfulness. Um, I remember once, um, it was a Sunday morning. My kids had religious ed at 9.30 and uh, I'm getting the kids ready. And my son, Christopher, was maybe eight years old. Um, and um, you know, I'm racing around the room to get them done religious ed on time. And he knocked over like a glass of milk or something on the counter. And I got all bent out of shape because now in my brain, I'm thinking there's milk all over the counter. Milk is dripping on the floor. It's sticky. I got to clean it up. It's going to set me back another four or five minutes. I'm getting all angry inside. And then I looked at Chris's crestfallen face and I'm like, Richard, you idiot. You're hurting his feelings. Mm -hmm. And my mindfulness took over. And I was like, and I looked at him and I said, Chris, I am so sorry I got upset with you. I said, I said, daddy was wrong. You didn't do anything wrong. It's called an accident for a reason. Mm -hmm. And and I'm so sorry I got upset with you. There's no reason for anybody to get upset because you knocked over a glass of milk. Mm -hmm. And it was it was only because I had started practicing mindfulness that I was able to step away 
hear my words and my tone of voice and go, mm -hmm. you idiot, what, look what you're doing to this poor kid. Mm -hmm. And I, I know, could I have done that five years earlier before I started reading Eckhart Tolle, um, you know, studying the, the desert fathers and mothers of the, of the Catholic church? Could I have done it? Probably not. Mm -hmm. because my brain, my neural pathways were just wired to go there. Mm -hmm. Stimulus response, stimulus response, stimulus response. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. Do you find that the principles that you use, that the methodologies that you see work, does it matter whether you're in a personal situation like I just described or an office professional situation? Well, I don't believe we are compartmentalized. We are one person, right? So and you, the goal is to live life to its fullest. And that means what you're doing professionally and also in your personal relationships. So I think that either way, um, I say mindfulness, but I do kind of more than mindfulness. It's not just for the sense of sitting and like the equivalent of being in an ashram. It's so that you can go off and do good things in life, right? And live your life to the fullest. And so I think that the principles and techniques can help you find joy, peace, success, and happiness. Because there are a lot of people who are successful, but they're not happy. So it depends on how you define success. And so to me, there's toxic success and then there's joy-based success. And so my goal would be as I'm working with people is that they are finding the joy in life. And when you are operating from a place of joy, you're more creative, you're more innovative, you're more productive. So you show up at work differently. Yeah. And so therefore, wherever I am, be it in my relationships, with my family, friends, loved ones, or my coworkers, it can create a, a you know a, a more positive, supportive, and nurturing, productive environment. Now, um, if anybody who's watching, if you go to lindamarshall.org, um, that's where Linda's company Reawaken is based. If you go to her blog, she actually talks about how. As she began on this path of mindfulness and learning meditation, she started using it in the office. Mm -hmm. um, she, she, you know, took this personal side of herself and learned how to incorporate it right there in the workplace. And it's, it is such an easy thing to do and can make all the difference in the world um, because it's so transportable. You just, you know, if you can find the time to shut down and, 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 and you know, get those inputs out and just be present. Even if you're in a meeting, I, I remember when I started studying Buddhism back in 05, 06, I would find myself in meetings when there was rancor or, or just, you know, we just weren't having a good meeting. And it was like, I would just observe it, step away a little bit emotionally and mentally. And it was almost like I was hovering above the scene. And it would give me great clarity. Oh, that person is upset because what we're talking about is going to impact their budget. That's why they're getting so defensive. Mm -hmm. And this person, I don't think this person realizes that's why they're reacting the mm -hmm. way they did. Mm -hmm. And it was only because of my mindfulness that I could kind of rise above the scene and go, oh, I get why this is all going mm -hmm. on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So Linda, you're going to be leading us on a 21 day letting go spring cleaning challenge. It's going to be over at a Facebook page that we started back in November, December. I'll drop the link for anybody who's watching this video and you've gotten to this point um, and you wanna join the challenge. It'll, the link will be in there. Um, I started it because I was doing a Chopra challenge and I opened it up to everybody to say, look, if you wanna join me with Deepak and Oprah Winfrey was doing it with him over the time. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people said to me, can we keep this going? Um, tell us a little bit about what you're going to do with us in this guided process of, of gaining more clarity. So if there's something in our lives we need to let go of, we'll be more capable of doing it. Yes, yeah, so it will be a multimedia, I guess, arrangement, right? <laughs> Using a combination of different talks, meditations, you know, and inspirational things, I hope, that Breaking into, in my mind, four phases. The first is taking inventory. Where are you? Assessing. What's working, what's not. Then what are some principles that you can use to guide you through a state of clarity? 
so that as you begin the purge, it would be good to have principles to support you in that. And I'm going to extract, as um, Richard, you mentioned, I'm a Chopra certified meditation instructor. So I'm going to use some of his seven principles um, of success for, and so to use those, then we'll go through the purge. And again, what are some of the things that you can release and embrace? So first you um, identify what it is you need to release. And then I like to use a little process to release it. And then what do you need to embrace? And then the final piece will be about the transformation. What are you doing differently? And so it'll be 21 days. Each day we'll have a post. Some days it'll be an audio. It'll be pieces of talks that I've done. And I would encourage people have a journal, pick one or two things that if you could um, transform or change in your life, then follow us through the process and see what unfolds for you. I, you know, I, I, I know I said what I was going to let go of, and this may be different than what I said a couple of weeks ago when we first announced the letting go. Mm -hmm. um, but I still have self-limiting beliefs. I mm -hmm. still don't see myself the way so many of my clients see me. And mm -hmm. I think I've got this gnawing, you know, lack of Know, total confidence in myself. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what I'm going to be working on is, is okay. making sure I move to a place where if somebody hands me a challenge, as long as I have the skill sets, I'm not being mm -hmm. egotistical, that I can say with great confidence to myself, of course, you can do that. Mm -hmm. and, and stop that, that narrative in the back of my head, oh, you're not as good as you think you are. <laughs> mm -hmm. And you, you know, again, that's that's uh, you know, like the imposter syndrome. So many people have this sense of, you know, they're going to find out one day that I'm not as good as I really am. And so I like to play with that with an avatar, you know, the other side of Richard, wearing the cape and the S. What would he do? Right. No limits. Right. And the more you play in that space, you begin to bring the two together. That that is who you really are. Yeah. And the key is to stop wasting the mental energy on the other thing, but that's a journey. So I, I love, I love that one. So you're going to have to let us know how you do with that at the end. I'm bringing my dustpan and my little broom and I'm just going to sweep <laughs> it out of the it away. <laughs> Linda, you, like I said, when I first met you back in 07, 08, I forget exactly what, when you finally came to the office in New York City and oh, I got five, to meet you. Oh, five, Richard. Oh, oh five. five. Yeah. Oh my gosh. <gasps> Oh my gosh, 15, 16 years. Yeah. When I first met you, um, you had an aura around you because it was mostly a male organization. It was you and Marianne Schroet at the VP level. Um, and you brought something that all that testosterone didn't have. <laughs> God, and, I love my <laughs> colleagues. Come, come. Oh, I love them all dearly. <laughs> Mark and, and Joe Quagliata and yeah. all of them. I love them all dearly. Yeah, uh, Roger McNamara remains one of the most uh, interesting and delightful human beings I've ever had a chance to meet. Um, and a man who has taught me a great deal about self-limiting beliefs and how to overcome them. Um, but you just come with a presence that just fills me that you know, hours after I stopped talking to you when you and I are just chit-chatting on the phone mm -hmm. or something, I just have this peace. And, and I think for anybody who's gonna, cause I'm gonna cut this video up and I'm gonna drop bits and pieces of it into the different um, Facebook groups that we're a part of. And what I want people to do is to um, look at this wonderful individual in front of you and understand that she truly lives her life with her arms wide open and just says, look, you know, um, you know, just come be yourself. You know, there's no judgment here and transform yourself to the person you want to be. I've always felt that around you, that you well, encourage you. people to head in that direction. And I'm just so grateful to, to know you. So can I just say one thing? It's a line I've been practicing. So it's from the movie Taken. Do you know that? <laughs> I may not know the line, but I know the movie. But it's what I would like to say is I have a unique set of skills that I've accumulated over a lifetime. And when I use those skills to my for my clients, it helps them to achieve great things. And for me, it is to help them uncover their magnificent. Now, Liam Neeson uses his skills for something different, but... <laughs> So to the extent that through our challenge, we can help people uncover their magnificence. I look forward to working with you on that, oh, Richard. Thank you so much. I am eternally grateful.
All righty. Okay. Have a great rest of your week and we will see you on Sunday in the Facebook group.